Well, let's open our Bibles together to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. We're going to look today at chapters 5 and 6, which is almost like a miracle because I uh, usually will only do a few verses, and, but today we're going to look at two chapters. As you're opening up your Bible to those uh, chapters, um, tonight we do have our ministry for those couples in who are infertile and, and uh, want to pray. It's called Hannah's Hope. It's at 5 o'clock, and uh, we invite you to be part of that prayer meeting. Then we have our evening service that follows that at uh, 6 o'clock tonight. This upcoming Wednesday, we continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. We're in Chapter 24 on uh, Wednesday night, continuing and coming to a conclusion in that particular study. Uh, but today we're in 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. Let's begin reading together here in uh, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 5. I'll read verses 1 through 7 and we'll get into our study. 1 Samuel chapter 5 beginning at verse 1 reading to verse 7. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon, our God. So we've been going through 1 Samuel, and as we were recently in chapter 4, we saw that the nation of Israel was battling against a people called the Philistines, the Sea Peoples. These are people who are living in southern Israel, normally uh, associated with uh, the Mediterranean coastline there, south of Jerusalem. And these people had gone to battle against Israel. Israel had gathered its army and had gone into uh, Shiloh and had taken the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant is a, a chest that represents the presence of God amongst the people. And so the children of Israel, the military personnel, came, took that particular ark, took it with them onto the battlefield. But while they were there, in battle, 30,000 soldiers died. The ark was captured, and two priests, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed. Now, Hophni and Phinehas are the sons of Eli, the priest of Israel. And so word comes to Eli that his sons have died, as well as the fact that the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. Now he took the death of his sons well, but upon hearing that the Ark was captured, he fell over and he died. Not only that, but his daughter-in-law, who was married to Phinehas, who was pregnant when she was giving birth, died and named her son, whom she had given birth to, Ichabod, which simply means that the glory has departed. This is something that found its way into the history of Israel and was remembered for centuries to this day. When you read, for example, the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in chapter 7, verse 12, God actually uses this as an example, as a warning to the nation, when he says, Go now to my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Shiloh was no longer there. And he's saying, go and see that the, the remnants of Shiloh, all you have there is just uh, evidence that a city at one time had been there, but it's been devastated. And he actually uses that as an example of what he's going to do in the nation. In the Psalms, in Psalm 78, verses 58 through 64, the psalmist said, they provoked him to anger with their high places, moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle at Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. 
He also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men. Their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. And so this had taken place. And, and the nation of Israel has lost the Ark of the Covenant. And so what is happening is we're picking up now what was taking place. And so uh, chapter 5 verse 1 begins by simply saying, The Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And so they captured the Ark and they took it 35 miles south from a region there in north there in Israel, 35 miles north. They took it 35 miles south to a place called Ashdod, one of their five main cities. And that's where we pick up the story. It, says in verse 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now, all scholars agree that the name and worship of Dagon originated in ancient Babylon. And so Dagon was a, uh, a god that was worshipped by these pagans that uh, had the representation of being half fish and half men. Half man. It's, they say it's like a merman. You know, half fish and half man. And that was, their, that was their god. This particular god's name, Dagon, means little fish. And so they would worship him as the one that uh, was, uh, was the chief deity of their pantheon. He was, he was believed by them to be the uh, father of the nature god Baal. And so he was of high esteem amongst these pagans. And so what they did is they brought the ark of, the, of, of God into their temple, the temple of their fish god. And they set this ark next to the idol Dagon. Now the reason they put this ark next to Dagon was because it was to symbolize that Dagon was superior to the God of Israel. And so they brought this ark in, they placed it in their temple next to their, their statue of their God Dagon as a representation that they had gained victory over Israel through the strength of their pagan deity. And they left him. But when they left him, notice what happened. It, it says in verse 3, When the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Now this gives you some insight into how ridiculous it is to be an idolater. I mean, their God needed some help to get up. And so they walk in, they see it, and he's laying there. And they say, oh, he fell over somehow. And they pick him up and set him back up on his pedestal. Now the bottom line is this. Is God had brought this, this, this idol symbolically to a position of doing homage to the greater God. That was what God was saying to these people. He was letting them know that there was no God other than the God of Israel, that the God of Israel is superior to their idol and their pagan belief system. That's what he's basically doing here. You see, it was not a good idea for them to put the Ark of the Covenant next to their God. And God deals with it because God is represented as being above all that is a so-called God. He is exalted above all false gods. So God himself overturns Dagon by forcing the image to appear to be giving homage to him. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 8 says, Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from, time, from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Well, the next day they return, and once again they find the idol on the ground, but this time its head and both hands are broken off. And that symbolizes that God has judged the idol. Because during that time, enemies would have their heads and hands removed, which would symbolize that they are dead and useless. And that's why the, the head and that's why the hands have been removed from this idol. God is saying, I am victor over this. This enemy has been vanquished. I am chief. I am above. I am exalted beyond. You know, when Isaiah speaks concerning idolatry, he speaks concerning the man who goes out to the forest and cuts down a tree. He says the portion of the tree that he cuts down, he breaks into kindling, and he uses it to, to start a fire and to cook his food. He says in the remainder, he, he makes into an idol. He overlays it with gold or silver, and, and he bows down before it, and he says to it, you are my God. And what God is saying there is idolatry is useless. He's saying that these idols have no power, no abilities to, 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 to help, to save, to be there in your time of need. Eyes they have, but they do not see. Ears they have, but they cannot hear. Noses they have, but they cannot smell. 
Mouths they have, but they cannot speak. Hands they have, but they cannot feel. Feet they have, but they cannot walk. And those who make them are like them, saith the Lord. And so he points that out and he says idolatry is useless. To have an idol is, is a useless thing. You need the living God. And so with Dagon he's presenting to them the fact that their so-called God is, is, is no God at all. And that's what he's doing. He's, he's warning these people about that. Well, just to show you how they are, instead of them understanding, what they do is they set up a tradition. It says it in verse 5. It says, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house and tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day, uh, neither, they don't tread on the uh, threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. They won't walk on the threshold. They actually would leap over it in superstition, in memory of the fact that at one point this head and hands were there at the threshold. Instead of repenting, instead of awakening, instead of saying there's something wrong here, we need to hear something that's going on here. Our God is on its face. Well, this, the Ark of the Covenant is obviously being worshipped by this God. There's a symbol here that we ought to see. Instead of doing that, they just accommodate their paganism and continue being pagan. They didn't even get the message that the Lord was giving to them. But God's hand is heavy upon them. Notice what he says here. He says in verse 6, The hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. He ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod, which is a city, and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. His hand is harsh toward us, and Dagon our God. Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of the, of the God of Israel away. So it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, with tumors. And they broke out on them. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So it was, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send, them, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with the tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Dagon's hands were cut off but God's hand moved in judgment against the Philistines. They were struck with tumors, and they had an infestation of rats. You'll see that in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And it's possible that these rats were carrying bubonic plague, and so all the territories of the Philistines are being destroyed. They were unwilling to release this ark. And the reason is, is because the ark symbolized their victory over Israel. So instead of releasing it and sending it back, they simply began moving it around. From Ashdod, it went to the city of Gath, went on to Ekron. It eventually uh, went through all five major cities. And so in verse 10, it says that they, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So in Ekron, God's hand is most severe and his judgment begins to escalate. It's been escalating from city to city, and now it's reaching its, its uh, greatest sense of his anger and wrath. In Job 31.3, we read, Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? As you read this with me, though, think about this for just a moment. It's interesting how the Lord had to repeat the same process five times. Everywhere the ark went, plague and pain broke out, but they wouldn't send it back. They could have sent it back when they first found their idol on its face. They certainly could have sent it back after they found the idol with its head and hands removed, but they didn't. When the first city was hit by plague, they could have sent it back, but they didn't. And it's because of the hardness of their heart and the resistance that they kept that ark with them and kept undergoing God's displeasure. There's something inside of us that I think is called human nature that causes us to have to go through the same kinds of lessons 
over and over and over again. It's human nature. It's bound up within our hearts. The rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child. And that's true. Human nature. I have a brother named Frank who has a son, Frankie. We used to call him Little Frankie. And when he was uh, a little over a year or so, Little Frank had come over with his parents to my parents' house and, and my brother and I were inside of the den watching TV when little Frankie came walking in and as he walked into the den, he saw the TV was on. Now, he was fascinated with the TV set. And so my brother turns to me and he says, he's going to walk up to the TV and he's going to put his hand on it. And he knows he's not supposed to do that because every time he touches the TV, we say, no, Frankie, don't touch it. And we actually spank his hand. But he is drawn by the TV set. Watch what happens. So the toddler comes walking in, sees the TV, and looks at his dad and looks at me and begins to walk to the TV set. And he walks very slowly, and he finally is standing in front of the TV. And as he's standing there looking at it, my brother says, Frankie, don't touch the TV. And little Frank turns and looks at his dad and then looks back at the TV set. And my brother says, watch. Frankie's less than two years of age and he's standing there with his hands on it, dropped to his side and he starts to shake. And as his hands are shaking, he's lifting one up. He looks like a TV evangelist. <laughs> his little hand is shaking. And he turns and looks at his father with his shaking hand. And Frank, my brother, says, Frankie, I'll have to spank your hand. Little Frankie's there, his hand six inches away from the screen. He closes his eyes. Bang! He touches the TV set. Just, and he knows it. I mean, he's like that waiting in human nature. Human nature. He knew he'd been told, don't touch it. Your hand is going to get spanked. There's something within us that when the Lord speaks to us and says, thou shalt not, we say, but I want to. It's when you're walking past the sign that says, stay off the grass. What do you do? You stand on the grass. You just, I have a picture of me laying next to a sign that says, stay off the grass. I'm laying there like that, holding the sign. There's just something inside of you that says, if you tell me not to, I'm going to do it. God says, you are not to eat of the, uh, the tree, uh, the, uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The enemy says, but it's beautiful to look at. It's going to make you wise, and I'm sure it must taste good too. And Eve just wants it. There's something inside of us that we have inherited that came through the fall. The enemy uses outside, but now there's something on the inside called a sin nature that is drawn by that, drawn by it. And God will say, don't do it because I will deal with you. And we say, I don't think you will. You're raised in a Christian home. Your mom and your dad teach you that your purity is a very special gift to give to your husband or wife when you get married. But somewhere along the line, you make a decision that you don't think is that important because after all, I'm in love with this person and therefore, eventually you, you yield. The Lord speaks to you, doesn't he? And he says, it was wrong what you did. You need to repent. If your dad and your mama saw what you did, it would break their heart, and you know it breaks mine. But you know what? The next time it was a little bit easier, wasn't it? And then the next time it was a little more easy, wasn't it? And the Lord is still speaking, saying, it's wrong. I'll have to deal with you. The first time you were on the job site and you saw whatever it was that you wanted for yourself, and it wasn't yours, so you stole it, Something spoke to your heart and said to you, that is wrong. That's called stealing, and it's wrong, and you know it is. Inside, you said, they're insured. They don't pay me that much, and I need it, and they'll never miss it, and you stole it. 
Sometimes we might even steal thinking that we're doing God's service. We had somebody in this fellowship over 20 years ago now, I can say this openly now, over 20 years ago, who used to make deliveries and was given cash whenever he'd make the delivery. And his wife came and spoke to us because he had been taking some of the cash and keeping it. And she said, and I spoke to him and found out that he'd been stealing from his company. And I said to him, you shouldn't be stealing from your company. But he said, I only need to steal $200 more because I'm wanting to buy a guitar so I can lead worship in children's ministry. Seriously. And I told Mike, you shouldn't have done that. You can't sing anyway. <laughs> no. no, they were literally, this is a true story. I could multiply stories like that. I won't. That's just one. Stealing money from the job to buy a guitar to lead worship for children, never connecting that this is a sin, even when confronted, trying to make it seem spiritual. People do that all, all the time. The first time you took that drink and your body told you this is not good, the first time you took, if you, hit, if you drank like me, I drank hard liquor and so when I, the first time I ever drank some whiskey, you know, my body told me this is not good. You know, there's a reason that worm's dead in that bottle. This is not good. But you know what? You get used to it after a while. You can get used to doing all kinds of things. Your body tells you it's wrong. Your conscience tells you it's wrong. This is wrong. You were not raised this way. And the Lord's hand will become heavy on your life. There'll be a sense of conviction in you, a sense of where'd God go in all of this? What happened? You know, I, I pray, but it feels like my prayers are going nowhere. It's because you are entertaining, remaining in sin with no heart to, to repent. Now, even pagans, God speaks to them through this. He says, I brought my judgment on you. You need to know that there's something you're doing that I'm dissatisfied with. But instead of them initially dealing with it, even though he, on two occasions they find their God at the feet of, uh, of the Ark of the Covenant and even dismembered, instead of dealing with it and seeking out answers at first, they simply move that, that Ark from place to place and every place that it goes, the same thing happens. Plague breaks out. People are dying and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And so, in verse 1 of chapter 6, the Ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your, your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land. You shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? And so they're concerned, what is taking place here? What is happening? It's interesting to note, though, and notice verse 1, that the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So God actually gave them a long time and several location changes until they got the message. Again, God doesn't ignore sin. He does move to deal with it. And sometimes he may not move in a way that is immediately noticeable, but over time you become aware that he has been bringing conviction. Your life has been dealt with by God. David, who later on becomes the king of the nation of Israel, is a very powerful man. He could basically have any wife that he wanted, but on one occasion, as he was there in his, in his home, his royal home, looking down the hill, he sees a young woman by the name of Bathsheba. She's outside taking a bath. 
It was a time when kings went off to war, but David had remained behind and let his men go and do the battles that he should have been leading them in. He sees her and his heart is inflamed with lust. He has her brought to him. He has a relationship with her. She sends word to him, I have become pregnant by you. We all know the story of David and Bathsheba. She has a, a husband who's one of David's loyal followers, a mighty man in the military, Uriah. He brings Uriah in off of the field a couple of times, tries to convince him to go home and be with his wife so that if Uriah has relations with Bathsheba, Uriah's going to think that the baby that is conceived by Bathsheba is, home, is his. But he's more noble than that. He refuses to go, and he doesn't. He doesn't go to be with his wife. My, my, my men are in their tents in the battlefield. You would have me to enjoy my wife in my home. I can't do such a thing. He refuses to go. His nobility that he has is so beyond anything David expected. So David sets it up for him to go be placed in the heat of battle. Troops around him are removed, and he's killed. News comes to David. This is how it's going on the battlefield, and Uriah has died. David waits a little while, marries Bathsheba, thinks that his sin is covered over. Ultimately, a prophet comes and speaks to him, gives him a, a parable, lets David know that his sin has found him out, and that trouble will never leave his house. David has a son through Bathsheba, but the son dies. David finally gets the message finally does and he writes a psalm psalm 32 and in this song he says this he says blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit when I kept silent my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Day and night I was withering up inside. Your hand was heavy upon me. That's what happens when you're in a, a relationship, when you're in a relationship with sin and, and God is speaking to you and God is saying, this needs to be removed so that I can take my hand off of you and I can begin to bless you. And God does that work. And these people here recognize that. They knew that something was taking place. God's hand was heavy upon them. And they're saying, maybe this is going to satisfy him. Maybe this will remove his hand. And so what they do is they get hold of their priests and they get hold of their diviners. Now, a diviner uh, is one of the religious leaders. Uh, they were the ones who were consulted in all important matters. And these diviners used things like witchcraft and astrology, sorcery, necromancy, spells, dreams, soothsaying, and omens uh, to deceive the people. This particular group of people, these diviners, were people that God had forbidden the children of Israel to have anything to do with. In, in Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 12, God said, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You are not to have these people who practice what we call today occult arts. Occultism, all of us in this room have heard the word occult. That guy's in the occult. The word occult literally means hidden things. That's what the word occult means, hidden things. And the reason it's referred to as the occult is because they are trying to discern those things that are hidden from their sight. So they will use Ouija boards. They will use palmistry. They will use astrology. They will use calling up the spirits of the dead. They, they go to their mediums and, and their spiritists and all of that to try and get direction. They're trying to find out something that has been hidden from them. But God tells us the secret things belong to the Lord. The things that I re re reveal belong to you, your children, and, your, and the following generations after them. 
There are some things God says that belong to me that no matter what you do, I will not reveal to you. There are other things that I am willing to reveal to you. But people practicing occultism, going to the spiritists, going to the medium, reading their horoscope and all the rest, these are people who are circumventing the will of God. God has given to us His mind. He gives us His mind through His Word and God has given to us His Holy Spirit. So by His Spirit and through His Word, we can discern the will of God in our lives. We don't need to go to the occult. We don't need to go to astrologers. We don't need to go to necromancers. We don't need any of that. And that's what God had said. He said, you're not to have anything to do with them. But they had their diviners that they went to. And in this particular occasion, their diviners actually knew something and they gave them proper understanding. What they do is they propose a trespass offering because they knew that somehow the people had dishonored the God of Israel. So they fashioned their tumors and rats into images to show that they recognize why God was angry. And then their advice in verse 5 was simply give glory to the God of Israel because perhaps he will lighten his hand from you. The question is asked in verse 6, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened theirs? They had heard of what God had done in Egypt. So they remind them of his past deeds. They're saying, don't harden your heart. God brought ten plagues on the, on the Egyptians. You've already had five. Why go any further? Hebrews 3.13 says, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin always looks better when you're involved in it. And never looks so bad as when you see your sin being practiced by somebody else. It's amazing to see alcoholics trying to counsel other alcoholics. And guys who are, who are doing their drugs trying to counsel other people not to take drugs. And guys who are going out or women who are going out on their husbands or wives trying to counsel other people about how to have a good marriage. Physician, heal thyself. How many times... Does God have to say something they're saying until we hear it? Do not harden your heart as the Egyptians did. You've suffered through five. They went through ten. We have to do something is what their counsel is. And so they give this direction. They say, look, go get two milk cows. Put them on a cart. Yoke them to a cart. Take their calves that are nursing. Put them in stalls. Put the Ark of the Covenant and these tumors and rats on that cart and release the cows and see what the cows do. You see, they're trying to prove whether or not they're actually understanding what is taking place and so they do a very hard test because a cow that is nursing its calf is not going to abandon the calf. Also, a cow that has never had a yoke placed over their shoulders is either going to rebel against the yoke and try and fight it or they'll just stand still and not move. And so if you put this yoke on them, hitching them to the cart, and they actually abandon their calf, that tells you that, that the God of Israel is upset. And if they go towards Beth Shemesh, which is a priestly city, if they go off to a city of the Jews, then we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God of Israel is behind all of this. And so they do that. They, they put the cart on the, uh, on the cows, and the cows are moaning. Their, their internal desire is to go to their babies, not to be taken in the other direction. And off they go. It says in verse 10, the men did so. They took two milk cows, hitched them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Bet Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Bet Shemesh. Now, the people of Bet Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Bet Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the, the large stone. Then the men of Bet Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So 
when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, were fortified, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Bet Shemesh. And so as the, the cart come and he, they hear the cows moaning, the people of Bet Shemesh being priests, this is a priestly city, rejoice because they see that the ark is finally returning. It's been seven months. And so they take the cows and they slaughter and make the cows an offering because the cow had been used for a holy purpose of carrying the ark. It couldn't be used for domestic purposes any longer. So they make it as an offering to the Lord. And they're rejoicing over this. It's kind of like happy days are finally back again. And so you see them rejoicing, but something happens. Notice verse 19. He struck the men of Bet Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Bet Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Yerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Interestingly, what they did is, here comes the ark, but it says in verse 19 that the Lord struck them because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Now, it was a chest. Some would say that, he, that they lifted up and looked into this chest, this ark, and as a result of that, God judged them. The literal reading in English at least says that. The Hebrew carries an, another connotation which could be to be looking at the ark with disrespect or no reverence. In any case, God brought judgment to them because of the way they regarded that ark. They showed disrespect to it. There was no reverence. Now what's interesting on the one hand is these are priests who should know better. They know how to handle the ark and they should have known better in terms of how they, how they received it and all of that. They should have had a reverent attitude, but they didn't. They had an improper attitude. The pagans, on the other hand, didn't really know anything. That's why they went to their priests, their diviners, and said, what do you think we should do? So the pagans who were living in darkness actually acted finally in a better way than those who should have been walking in the light. It's interesting how that in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said, he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. The more you know, the more you're responsible for. The children of Israel knew and didn't act appropriately. James says, let him who knows to do good and does not do it, well, to him it is sin. And so they knew the right thing to do and how to handle that ark and the proper way to look at it. But instead of doing that, they were disrespectful towards it. As a result, God broke out upon them and dealt with them. So they're upset. They don't know what to do. They say in verse 20, who's able to stand before this holy Lord God? To whom shall it go from here? Let's get it out of here, is what they're saying. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Yerim, which is a, a, a city about 10 miles a little to the north, and they actually get rid of the ark. They send it up there. They removed it. They didn't seek God for advice. They didn't, they didn't seek God for direction at all in this. They simply got rid of the ark. And sometimes when the Lord deals with us, we don't repent and we don't seek Him. <laughs> we just stop going to church. We just stop reading. We just stop fellowshipping with God's people. Instead of saying, God, what have I done wrong because I want to have fellowship with you? Sometimes we do the same thing. We just try and send him away. We don't want this in my life. You're causing problems, not blessings. Instead of us saying, my God says he wants to bless my life. Therefore, I must be doing something to displease him because I know he wants to bless me. We simply say, no, instead of blessings, he's bringing cursings. I'll just get rid of him. And that's what they did. They said, you take the ark. We have to get him out of here because look what he did to us. So rather than saying, God, forgive us, what did we do wrong? They simply try to avoid responsibility and try to get rid of the Lord's presence from them. It's something we can learn from.
when the Lord speaks to us, we ought to listen the first time. Our Father, we ask that you would work in our lives. You have given us your word. You have given us your spirit. You've given to us wise counselors who love you, Lord, and, and know your word and, and follow you by your spirit. You've given to us provision, Lord. May we take advantage of that which you've given to us. When you speak to us once, may we hear, Lord. May we not stay in sin, relishing and enjoying it more than our fellowship with you. So I ask, Lord, that we would learn lessons even as we read through your word that will help us to live lives that are blessed by you. Forgive us, Lord, for the areas of our life that we indeed quench your spirit. And thank you, Lord, for blessing us in those areas that we have yielded. May we yield even more to you, even today. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Perhaps we have some right now who need to get right with the Lord, and you know it. I want to pray for you. As we're quietly seated before the Lord, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, saying, you need to get right with me, there are things that you, you need to have dealt with, and I've been speaking to you about them, and it's time to release and yield these things then you need to do that now. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. And if you need to get right with the Lord right now, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Just raise your hand so I can see you. Father, you see these hands and you know the reason why they're being raised to you. I'm asking now in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch these lives. Lord, in Jesus' name, that as they empty themselves before you and say, God, forgive me, that you will fill them with your spirit, your presence. May they open themselves to you now. And I ask that you'll give them the ability, Lord, from this day forward to rejoice even as David when he said, Blessed is the man whose transgressions have been covered. May they have the joy of knowing that their sins are forgiven even now, Lord. And may they walk with you from this day forward. Bless you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And I ask that you keep moving in all of us, Lord, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll close with a, a word of prayer and with a song. Our Father, we ask that you would now move in us and through us. We leave this place and enter into a ministry field, a missions field. In Jesus' name, go with us as we serve you. And we ask this, Lord, because it brings glory to you. Bring us back tonight. Bring us back throughout the week, Lord that we might continue in fellowship, continue growing in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.